this is the wave. It starts right now. Where are the biggest opportunities right now for entrepreneurs? If you're not building something today, just like go build something real simple. Build and launch. And any in the time frame needs to be under a week. The last time we saw this was the phone. Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. My name is Liam Motley, your number one source for AI entrepreneurship content. Today we're joined by a very special guest, uh, Paul Jacobian, founder of Copy AI, uh, one of the leading AI writing platforms in the market today. So welcome on, Paul. Thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate your time today. Thanks, it's great to be here. First off, thank you for coming on. Uh, I know you have some great insights to share with the community and uh, we'd love to hear more about Copy AI and why it's so great. So to start off, uh, can you tell us a little bit about your background and what led you to AI entrepreneurship as you are today? Sure. Yeah, so my background's a little bit varied all over the place. Uh, I started out as a CPA doing accounting uh, out, of, out of college, uh, went into the finance um, industry at a hedge fund, and then learned, you know, about the finance stuff, the bookkeeping stuff, but that was really all kind of boring and, and uh, wasn't quite as exciting as real entrepreneurship, really operating companies. And so I ended up moving into the startup world, um, helping a, a family member um, grow one of her companies that she had started and left that for venture capital in 2016. And that's where I met my current co-founder. We were helping employees exercise their stock options at venture backed startups. And we were really interested in the next big waves. We were trying to figure out, all right, well, what is the next thing? What is the nature of these like technological changes that really spurs, you know, rapid expansion and technological progress? And we, you know, we'd seen a lot of AI companies. Um, unfortunately, it seemed like a lot of the technologies are pretty niche for very specific verticals. And so it wasn't like a broad based technology that could be applied to all kinds of use cases um, really easily. And then, um, in late 2019, we got to test out GPT-2, which was really the first, um, that was really the first generative kind of tech that I had used personally. And what was really fascinating stood out, Liam, is you would type something in there and let it auto-complete, and then it would come up, like you could get it to come up with crazy stuff, like crazy new stuff, and then you'd Google it, and you wouldn't find any search results for the thing that it created. And that was really the aha moment for me. I was like, man, if you could create anything, then the ROI from this technology is un unlimited because that means that there is no capped amount of value it could create. If you let it loose, it can go create really anything, um, like things you can't even imagine. And so this idea that creativity would be the first real use case of it, um, to us was pretty clear. The, the whole point of it is to get it to like do things that are interesting and creative and original and even now um this is still something that we want out of these out of these generative models um we thought it'd be about seven years before it could be like commercially viable in a uh enterprise context but uh fast forward six months and they launched gpt3 and in, in the 20 in the summer of 2020 and then immediately because the model you know was about a hundred times the size and they, you know, trained it with more data, it did actually hit that tipping point. And so it, it went from one in 10 kind of results being good to around nine out of 10. Um, and then if you, if you created, you know, multiple examples uh, via prompting, you could actually get it to do a task repeatedly pretty well. And so at that moment in time, um, my, my co-founder and I, we just kind of said all right we got this is it like this is this is the wave it starts right now <laughs> and so we started um launching mvp little side projects we got instant access like we got access as fast as we could to the uh the, the gpt3 api and then um <clears throat> launched about five mvps in two and a half months and then um, each time we launched we learned something new we figured out, you know, a, a better way to replicate what we were doing on the back end from an engineering standpoint. So this was this was already going into the the, uh, the copy AI AI side of things, or you were just playing around with anything you could get your hands on and, and seeing what you could do with the GPT three. Uh, that, yeah. So we, you know, it's just like fun fun projects. You know, you don't know where, it, you don't know what's going to take off. So it wasn't like we quit our jobs to do, you know, to do a startup. It wasn't like that. Um, but we got to do like five different things. We built a summarization uh, tool that got mentioned in the Wall Street Journal. It was like, all right, that's cool. People use it. Like, let's go do something else. Let's keep going. Um, 
And then we ended up building a site called taglines.ai, which was just a tagline generator. That's all it did. And so you just type in your product uh, name or, or product description and it would just generate a tagline. That thing took off. We had over 2000 people um, try that out and use that in like the first week or so. And um, we started to see people use it for all these different marketing and sales use cases um, for email copy, website copy. And so it really validated that there were a lot of use cases that could use um, some tooling like that. And then we also found out, you know, we were thinking, oh, well, this is like, a, it's just for marketers. And as it turns out, you had all kinds of users using the tools and finding value in them. And so that really validated. And we also set up like a little Stripe paywall. Highly recommend figuring out if anybody will pay you for the thing you built <laughs> quickly. <laughs> and so, yeah, so within the first week we validated one, people would know how to, how to use the interface. Two, that the use cases were varied like they're kind of related, but there were a lot of use cases people were using these tools for. Uh, three, that all kinds of users would use it, not just like the hyper focus, like copywriters. So we went back to the drawing board and said, okay, we have literally one tool. That's all this thing does. Let's go build like a suite of them. We rebranded it as copy.ai and we launched that and that, that took off uh, relatively quickly. And so with, with the like tagline generator, yeah. in terms of the, a lot of these the startups right now are, are front running what the users are putting in with a sort of pre-prompt to gpt3 correct so a lot yeah. of the stuff on copy ai is like setting up a preset uh angle that you've gone down with gpt3 and then users put the input on top of that right so is that how you do that's most of them? that's how you get it started yeah you, you bootstrap okay, so. your data set with prompts but then over time you mm -hmm. end up taking the data feedback from users and fine-tuning tools for that use case yeah that was one of my big questions for you because as i i see it there's the sort of direct usage of GPT-3 and the, and the API, which is let's just use it for, for prompt and, and completion calls. And then we're going to be a little bit cheeky about it. And we'll do a, a sort of pre-prompt uh, to uh, GPT-3 to get it to understand a certain scenario. And then we're going to let users build on top of that, that preset scenario. So, um, and then I guess there's the fine tuning side of things, which from my own uh, experimenting with seems quite um, difficult to understand at what point uh, it eventually becomes a flexible understanding of something. So um, could you talk a little bit about your experience with fine tuning and uh, your results and I guess experience with getting the, the training data fit into GPT-3? It works, all right. You can get it to work. You need a lot of data. That's That tends yeah. to be a pretty safe assumption across every kind of generative AI use case. Mm -hmm. um, so the more data you get, the more you can train it to kind of produce the results that, that your users find valuable. Um, yeah, there are all kinds of like so, techniques and things, but it's, that's a pretty standard yeah. process right now. Okay. Um, and I guess for the users who aren't 100% familiar with Copy AI, I've, I've played around with it. Number, I, I love a lot of the tools. I was particularly <laughs> yeah. the sort of startup uh, focused ones. They help you with ideation and, and YouTube video stuff, which is a, all great tools that I've been enjoying. Um, if you could just give a quick run through of sort of the, the core and your mind, the core features that you provide and a, an example of the target users that you, you typically have using your platform. Sure. So anyone writing sales or marketing copy. So if you're writing emails, if you're like sales emails, if you're writing emails to your users, if you're needing to create like website content, you can describe kind of what what kinds of content you're looking to get. You describe your product or your, or your company, and then it'll give you ideas instantly. So it's like you, you type that in, it, it'll generate, you know, multiple sets of results for you to review and find something that, that works for for your particular copywriting use case. So we we started out, you know, with these preset tools and um, over time, you know, we said, okay, there are infinite use cases, right? Which you can't fit into tools. So what is the path forward? In a, in a world where you can do anything with this. And I think you've seen this with ChatGPT work out pretty well where it's really open-ended, really flexible. So I, I do think that, that the chat kind of interface where you can have that feedback ex user feedback experience is going to be a really interesting interface paradigm as well. And so that's something that we're gonna be uh, implementing and, and building into the core of our product as well. For sure. Yeah. Um, with uh, GPT-4 coming, how much are you <laughs> How is that affecting your strategy going forward? And you gotta assume it's gonna be awesome, right? <laughs> I mean, um, it'll be much more powerful. And so it these models are gonna end up eating 
both interfaces. They're going to eat APIs. They're going to connect to the internet. They're going to eat eat up like, you know, uh, index content. I mean, it's it's for real. It's not just like, oh, you know, let's carve this little niche out here. It's not like that at all. It's it's a um, it's a very large ship sailing increase increasingly fast, right? And you really want to get on board that ship. You want to look out as far into the distance as you can. And, and even even now, people online are like, oh, you know, AGI is so far away. I'm like, no, no, it's 2023. Give it, give it a couple months. <laughs> That's what I said. I'm like, 2023, all this stuff's accelerating. We already yeah. know Google has. Uh, better models yeah. than what's publicly available now and you know larry and sergey just came back they came yeah, back to google to do this so I'm coming back you're telling me that we're not going to see massive exponential progress in an mm -hmm. arms race and in now in a competitive environment at the base yeah. layer it's that's if crazy it's enough talk. to put those guys out of like essential retirement and be like i'm back in the game i'm ready to ready to make another shift um i, I fully agree with you on that this is um sort of a, a new era of of tech and it's a different different breed and, and like you said earlier that it's when you noticed that it was a uh, it's going to affect a lot of areas and i think for me I, I remember growing up sort of the past eight years as a as a high school kid and stuff i was looking around like yeah we've get we've got smartphones we've got this and we've got that but like i knew that these things weren't going to be as i was like we've had this big smartphone wave what's this next big thing and in my head i couldn't figure out what this thing was and as soon as i had my first go with chat gpt i was like this is yeah, it. yeah. this is how, this is the big one how old are you i'm only 22. 22 all right i'm 35. when you don't you don't maybe remember when like phones first came out or the internet came out no i mean, uh, I mean dude imagine the internet coming out yeah. you know like yeah. that was it one of those moments for you the Same yeah the moment. internet was for sure the internet was and then um Napster, when you could get any song, you download any song yeah. on the planet for free. Instantly. Yeah, I was using LimeWire. That was LimeWire, like, man. LimeWire era. I mean, you downloaded. I downloaded every song, every song. Mm -hmm. It's on a, like a external hard drive. So, yeah. those are paradigm shifts, and your mind is exploding. And then, relatively quickly, people just adapt to it. And you're like, oh yeah, we have Spotify. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's like they just yeah. don't compute to have access to every song. Yeah, in sure. History. Of oh, course man, we do. Much right. Tips, of course. But it makes sense yeah. that we would. And that's that's how technology mm -hmm. works. And technology is a a force for making things cheaper. That's how you know you have technology. If it gets if things get more expensive, you don't have technology. When we talk about like AI products being free or not or whatnot, like, yeah, of course, like they'll be free. You look at Google is free. And it's incredibly valuable, right? They don't try to charge you for that. They just have, somebody has to fig, figure out the business model. Mm -hmm. Say if, if ChatGPT is going to sort of play a role like a, a revolution of search, how would these uh, ChatGPT tools like that be um, monetized? And the current strategy that they've just put out, it's, it's this new thing that you see with these AI tools like Midjourney and stuff that you're paying for premium access to servers and, and first re first results and stuff, but if it was yeah it's hard to imagine google, that that's yeah, if google be made their term. search platform pay and <laughs> yeah. a, a charge per search initially then right it would, it'd kill the business overnight so it's been interesting seeing how they're gonna get to that paid situation i think what they have is, is not a bad not a bad medium where you can pay if you're using it for commercial purposes or using it as a as a serious uh works person then you can get these faster access to the results i don't know i mean these models are going to be embedded into your iphone like on on the hardware so it's hard to imagine those business models last being very durable right mm -hmm. with my business partner we're talking a lot about uh, where's the like you said it's going to replace the apis and it, like personal assistants and the stuff and it's basically just going to connect to everything we, we were thinking it needs to be chat gpt but you can ask it things or you make a personal assistant and then you uh develop a program that will allow it to interact with uh, Google Sheets or your calendar or this and this and this. And that's very basic stuff. And like you said, I think that's going to become we mainstream. Have, we, and, and it's Yeah, I mean, we have some of that. <clears throat> some of that already exists and you can get mm -hmm. those different connectors set up. Google Sheets is going to get a massive improvement. Mm -hmm. Like just the way that data gets organized is going to be incredibly, it's going to be an incredibly powerful product 
once they embed that in probably this year mm -hmm. Um, just for the, the viewers who aren't familiar with the, the history of, of Copy AI, could you give yeah. us a, uh, a quick rundown of funding, employees, your users, and, and all of that, that good stuff that I'm sure you're very proud of? Yeah, I think we've, you know, we've done well. We've gone the venture-backed route. It was a decision that we way to figure out. Um, like my partner and I, we had got it up to like 50000 a month in, in uh, recurring revenue before we hired our first employee. And then um, we ended up raising a total of $14 million for, for like seed round and series A. And then um, we've grown the team to like 34 people and um, past uh, 12 million now in uh, revenue run rate. And awesome. from a user wow. standpoint, we really, we very much believe in free products, freemium. Um, so we've had, I think we just passed 5 million users sign up for this product uh this past week so we're trying to really build very long-term uh distribution around the product and the mm -hmm. platform and we want to you know we want to make you know make something that people want that's really critical to who we are as a company um i think you're gonna really like when you're at it's not like 35 people it's not a huge company right google has i think 100 and 20,000 or something people it's a lot of people and they have a lot of funding so if you're going to be nimble as a startup and lean you have to you have to really play into your strengths and so when you're a lean team that means that we can be scrappy we can build things quickly we can pivot um you know engineering teams to you know building what what you know anything that gets released that's a game changer you want to integrate that really fast and all of that really accelerates your growth engine as well, because users continue to find increasing amounts of value in the platform. What's going to be interesting is, and um, still I think a little bit early to see where the, um, how to translate distribution and growth and usage into like really powerful business models that win. And I, again, I don't, I'm not sure that Charging for chat, GPT, you know, 40 whatever dollars a month is going to really be that competitive if if uh, Google just integrates that and just, they just integrate it into the search engine and then they're in every interface. And they're not going to need to be charging for it either. Yeah. No. And they happen to own Chrome, YouTube, mm -hmm. Gmail, G Suite. Yeah, pretty big. <laughs> search. Big competitor. Android. I mean, they have sewn up so much distribution. And then if it, it does end up at the hardware layer and the OS layer, they own that, they own a lot of that too. Um, and Apple's already, you know, thrown themselves in the mix as well. So I think you're looking at hyper. You're gonna look at a hyper competitive environment. All eyes are on AI for big tech, and so I am anticipating, you know, very very fast improvement here. And what's your experience been like with VCs of of? speaking to my business partner about getting funding for different ideas and he's always been very uh sort of against going that route because he feels like as soon as we take the money then there's going to be people over our shoulder so what's what's your experience been like and uh what's your relationship like with your your vcs our relationship's great because but we also were very fortunate to have the best vcs invest in our company um Venture cap. There's nothing magical about venture capital. It's just an investor, right? It's my investing money. Um, as that industry has grown, it's harder to bring in founders to become investors. And so, if you haven't started thing, you know, companies before, or been very, very early, and, have, and you really see the process of company formation and making, it's very hard. Um, outside of very like your core expertise area to provide advice so the things that you tend to get are like introductions which are really helpful the capital itself obviously very helpful um you know you hear horror stories though some people have really bad bad experiences and then the more investors you invite invite into your company the higher the odds that you're going to hit one of those really bad investors so uh I always recommend doing back, you know, reference checks with founders that have worked with 
that uh, investor over a long period of time. Um, so yeah, I'd say be do your dil do your diligence. Don't think like, oh, I'm tricking this person into investing. You know that you're just it's not going to work. It's really not going to work, and you're going to end up in a bad position. So play it like a long term game. Um, and and do not lie ever in fundraising <laughs> process. Yeah, life is too short for that shit. Then people will will figure you out. We'll find yeah. out. Yeah, yeah. A lot of it's reputation based. So as as it's all reputation that. based because you have. That's how the startup world works. There's an insane amount of trust that you give to someone else, um, without re doing reference checks. Like that's how things are so efficient and move so quickly. You don't need to like get a, a warm intro. Like you, I think you just cold message me. I'm like, sure, I'll do a podcast. <laughs> you know. So like that's how the world should work. We should all trust each other. And you hear these horror stories. You hear these like about these startups blowing up and like you know just total outright fraud. I do not want people to think that that's how it it, it is done or should be done, and that you should expect that or you should you should behave that way. Um, so if you're if you're um, this is your business partner, if your business like if you're if you think that venture capitalists are going to ruin your company, you should not raise money because because you will not give them the benefit of the doubt. You won't trust them. And that's really critical that you do that. Awesome. Um, what do you look for in core team members and co-founders? I think this is a very big topic and important for, for people who are watching to, to get some advice from you and your experience of how did you know that the person that you co-founded Kobe AI with was someone you could trust long term and that they had the qualities that you were ready to move forward with and trust in a business relationship because business is one thing uh, friendships are another and they're often a, a bit of a, a gray mix when when they come together uh yeah i mean i'm just insanely lucky my my co it was my colleague and then he and i became friends instantly when we met and started working together so we had already worked together for four years and uh i trust yeah you know, trust him with my life he's he's incredible and he's you know extremely talented um engineer and an insanely like highly futuristic thinker so it's just beautiful match um <clears throat> it, i would not recommend i know people ask like oh i need a co-founder for my company i would not recommend <clears throat> bringing on a co-founder you don't know or you met in the past Absolutely. two months the trust don't you gotta trust them 100%. Very, very deeply, very, very mm -hmm. deep trust. And um, so again, would not recommend. Mm -hmm. And in, in hiring your sort of key uh, key positions, uh, what have you found as a as a co-founder? Uh, what was your process of learning learning how to hire well? And I'm sure you've um, run into that a lot. Uh, what, if, what are your things that you could recommend to people who are in the position of having to hire some really crucial staff? Uh, what are the things that you look for or what are the red flags that would turn you off someone uh, who was looking to join your company? Yeah, for like we're a software company. So, you know, finding great engineers is is like a key thing. And um, one of our friends was a like contract CTO. So he had been CTO. He helped <clears throat> do the initial interview screens, really helped guide us through that process um, and then helped us find a really great head of engineering and that that's been amazing like our engineering staff is is top 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 tier and then across across the rest of the organization it is it is a little bit harder like it's it's somewhat narrow to define um you know kind of the engineering skills you're looking for and it's pretty easy to do the to get a, a, a sense of culture on the other on the other side like you know product design marketing um, we're looking for people that, because we want to maintain a lean focus, they they have had experience doing like lots of different types of things and have a really good sense of where to focus time and how to prioritize what's important. So that's worked that's worked well for us. Um, uncovering that would just go really you know go as deep as you can into the the resume, the projects they've worked on, understand how their brain works. References references and all that so those are really key i can't i can't stress references enough um and then we've also been fortunate because we we have like 
so so much of our companies out in the public you know online that we have a lot of applications when we post jobs job openings and so it's a it's a very big pipeline and it actually to find people that fit what you're looking for and match like culturally um like for us optimism's huge right we're a remote company that means every time i get on a zoom call with someone else we have to feed each other energy right and so that's really really critical um in this remote world so do you know does the team have that chemistry because that's how you open up communication yeah chemi online chemistry must be even even harder to find than, it's than it's chemistry. not easy it is that's not. a tough job i didn't realize you were fully remote that's it's tough, tough. yeah my co-founder is not even in the same city as i am but we had w oh, worked okay. remotely before so we were working remotely yeah um, um in terms of uh as a startup founder, uh, if you were looking to, st to step into the, the AI space and, and start a business, how important do you think technical ability is in a startup founder? And is it 100% necessary? Do you need sort of a, a rough understanding? Because I, I know there's a lot of people looking to get into it and saying that, yes, this is the future. I want to try and build something here and build some value. But they're so clueless when it comes to anything ML or uh, machine learning or anything. You know, they're, they're just so blind on that side of things that maybe marketers coming in uh, and they just they they can't even grasp a lot of the stuff. So, what what are your thoughts on technical ability for startup founders? Um, well, you've got kind of two periods. One is before transformer models like GPT three, and then the second period is after that. So before, yeah, you needed like someone with data science skills, machine learning skills, because you had to go find models, build the right models, test them in in production. Like that that's a whole at least a person that's just doing that after gpt3 it's literally low code so it's like you just describe what you need in this and the um you know you can implement it into an application so the technical requirement for building a, a company that uses ai to do something is is much lower now than it used to be um so i would encourage yeah i'd encourage people you you do need to know you need to know what can what's possible. Like that's very important to understand technologically what is possible. Uh, the hardest part is understanding it at a deep enough level to engineer your architecture in a way that makes it really flexible yeah. and modular. So that that would be the thing that you'd want. And then if you're a founder and you're not technical, you need to be really good at at business and really understanding the business use cases and applications. Awesome. But in terms of say building on top of GPT-3, would you say um, directly building on top of it and just allowing people a, a, a nicer way to interact with it uh, for some certain use case, that's the sort of model people should be looking at or are there other areas that are also just as exciting that people may not be aware of? Um, well, these models are gonna do work. They're actually gonna do work. They're not just gonna, <laughs> it's a total transformation of software. Software used to be just, here are the rails, like we've set this up so that you can do this task pretty easily you just go through a workflow to these steps these models are going to do all that work so we're, we are in a total transformation everything has to get rebuilt and redone and it's going to be in the next kind of two year time frame when that needs to happen so if you're looking out and you're like i don't know what to build you are not like you need to get in deep in in some kind of use case and get and start just building stuff and understanding how the, the technology works so i would i would not recommend like hey we're gonna go start a business i'd much rec recommend you know recommend yeah, yeah, yeah build some side projects and launch them and see what happens awesome so would you say find someone who's if you're not necessarily technically capable find someone who is and then and sort of just get deep and start bouncing ideas for each other would be a good place to start yeah and it's probably wouldn't be a bad idea for you even if you're not technical to figure it out okay it's not it's not a two-year thing to build something anymore and if you don't know what the, the stack is you need to go figure that out first 
I'm about to post just a, a basic fine tuning guide for people to, to just get ChatGPT uh, to help them make a, a fine tuning um, script and then just put it through, get a bunch of example data of ca Kaggle that, that I grabbed and put it through and did a fine tuning process. So I'm trying to educate people on the channel a little bit That's as well awesome. who may be blind. Um, and just be able to, I, I say in the video, just that you need to know that at least the, the, the starting <laughs> bit of information, yeah. how people are doing this, and then you're going to be light years ahead of people who are um, completely blind and, and don't know how a lot of this stuff works. Yeah, comp um, comp any company is going to need people that understand how it works. Even at a base level, they're, you're going to be really, really valuable. Can you discuss uh, any exciting developments or plan for the future for Copy AI? I expect that the like we're approaching a singularity from a technology standpoint and a singularity means that you suck in everything right everything collapses in into one really tight mass of value the last time we saw this was the phone the iphone mm -hmm. right before the iphone you had a digital camera you remember those did yeah, they have those when you were a yeah. kid <laughs> okay yes yes <laughs> do you remember the, the old camcorders right and do you yeah, remember? Yeah, do you remember what flashlights look like? Do you remember flash? Yeah. <laughs> do you remember what like that, yeah. what watches look like? They tell you the time. Yeah, yeah, I got. It. <laughs> okay. That's, that's the so right. what I happened? Have, I want Apple Watch too. So. Uh, so the hardware ate everything up. Just ate all of it up. Like the old telly, you know, like all of it is at literally everything is now on a phone. Same thing's gonna happen in software where everything gets eaten by the model all the interfaces the front end the works the problem is going to be when you if you're a big tech company and you have a certain business model that's dependent on certain types of activities happening if there's a disruption in the way that activities happen which is what we think then the value shifts like the value that you can capture and monetize shifts elsewhere and then you got a you got a whole new problem on your hands Okay. Well, uh, one last question. Yeah. Um, what is your life outside work like? Uh, what are your hobbies? How do you stay sane as a uh, as a founder with a lot oh, of I've pressure got, on your shoulders? I've got two kids. Two. Two kids. Yeah, they keep kids. you pretty busy. They're great. Yeah. I'm. A, I'm. Awesome. You know, huge on family. Married. Mm -hmm. Happy. Awesome. Do they? That's, a, that's I do a great the role model for grilling for the younger younger viewers. Grilling. I don't know why, but every algorithm on my phone is just now showing me like videos of somebody cooking a steak <laughs> everything it's just constant steak cooking, cooking. on my phone like how did, what are they yeah. doing this like can i turn this off and it's like no you have to watch yeah. it they're listening to you of course <laughs> yeah um and i suppose one last thing any yeah. uh general advice for for an aspiring uh entrepreneur like yourself <sighs> oh yeah you gotta be optimistic one because no pessimists don't do shit nothing they don't do anything Nobody cares and they just depress everybody. So I don't want to hear it. Nobody wants to hear it. Two, if you're not building something today, just like go build something real simple and just con build and launch. And any in the time frame needs to be under a week. So anything you're doing needs to be under a week. And if you can't commit to doing something for a week, shrink the time frame to like two days. And if you can't do that, then just like set a timer for like an hour, build something and launch it. Awesome. Well, yeah. Paul, thank you so much Thanks, for your time. Hey. I appreciate it immensely, and I'm sure all the viewers do too. Um, everyone watching, be sure to go check out Copy AI if you haven't already. Uh, excellent tool. Um, I'd say the best writing platform you could possibly find at the moment. Oh my uh, God, it's going to get so much better. <laughs> it's going to get so much better, so much better as well. So you be in there. Um, and of course, head over to uh, Twitter and follow, uh, follow Paul. I'm going to drop his uh, Twitter down below so you can go show some love there and also keep up to date with what he's doing and what Copy AI is doing as well. So Thanks. thank you so much, Paul. Uh, have an awesome day. I don't want to keep you around for too much longer, Thanks. but I appreciate your time and uh, all the best. Thanks.